We're here at the Lutheran Theological Seminary for the latest episode of Real History. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Real History. I am your host Jared Frederick and today we have something very special lined up. We are in historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania at the Seminary Ridge Museum and I'm joined by my good friend Cody Yeish. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here at the Seminary Ridge Museum. I serve as Director of Education and Museum Operations here at Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. I've been here for about 10 years since the fall of 2012. Uh, which was the fall before the museum opened in July of 2013 for the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And in this episode, we're not only going to be addressing some of the history of this uh, very notable Gettysburg landmark, but even more in tune with our channel is that we're going to be looking at history versus Hollywood because, of course, this building was also used as one of the primary filming locations for the 1993 movie Gettysburg, which we have analyzed in depth on this channel. So we have some real treats in store for you on this one, and we'll start off by considering the history of this building itself. So before we start talking about the movie Gettysburg, give us the Cliff's Notes version history of this building, how it fits within the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. Certainly, the town of Gettysburg will welcome a Lutheran seminary in 1826. This building that we are sitting in is constructed in 1832 as the seminary expanded out of its original location in town. And so by the time of the battle, this is an institution that has been in Gettysburg for more than three decades. The building had about 24 students residing in it, a family of caretakers living on the first floor, as well as two professors' homes flanking the northern and southern sides of this building. But this would have been historically, at the time of the battle, uh, the entire Lutheran seminary under one roof. Anyone coming to Gettysburg to study theology, to become a Protestant minister, had the entire, all of their needs here for their education. Uh, we are sitting in the historic attic, which is the most original piece of the building. Most of what we are surrounded by, with some exception, uh, is from 1832. And that would include the historic base of the cupola. This, uh, this structure we can see just behind us is the, the, the foot, if you will, of the more famous part of the cupola that goes to the top of the building. And while it was originally constructed primarily for uh, for the sake of ventilation, for drawing heat through the top of the building to cool down the lower floors. Of course, we know this cupola most famously today for its use during the battle as a site of observation and communication by Lieutenant Aaron Jerome of the U.S. Signal Corps, uh, but also most famously by Brigadier General John Buford, commanding the 1st Division of United States Cavalry. But they will both make use of this cupola, as will several other soldiers and civilians uh, this would have been a rather popular place if we were sitting here in 1863 for folks coming up and down from that cupola. The building itself is going to have a more extensive and one might say more important use uh, in the days, weeks, and even months that followed the battle. And that is as one of the largest and longest serving uh, hospitals here on the Gettysburg battlefield. About 700 patients, including soldiers of both the United States and Confederate armies, are treated in and around this building up until September 16, 1863, uh, leading to the first of several renovations through the years as this building has served a multitude of functions since that time as well. What is the mission of the Seminary Ridge Museum today? So we are involved with preserving and educating the public on the sites pertaining here to the historic buildings that uh, were part of the seminary campus in 1863, most especially this original structure known as the Seminary Edifice or Schmucker Hall or Old Dorm through the years. Uh, we are operated by the Seminary Ridge Historic Preservation Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization uh, that operates the day-to-day -day operations of the museum itself. Uh, we focus really on kind of three general stories. One is the first day of the battle, especially its impact on the ground around this building and in this building. The story of Civil War medicine, especially the use of this building as the earliest and one of longest serving hospitals at Gettysburg after the battle. And then the bigger picture role of race and religion as pertains to the Civil War era, the causes and consequences that go along uh, with issues involving slavery, emancipation, as well as debates that are happening in this very building as a Lutheran seminary 
in terms of religious conflict leading up to and during the, the Civil War itself. Okay, here we are standing in front of the seminary, perhaps Gettysburg's most iconic building, but it's also in the summer of 1992, one of the primary filming locations for the movie Gettysburg. So tell us what happened here in the movie and how it aligns with the real historical record. So the first moment that we see this particular portion of the seminary building chronologically in the film is actually in the, in the director's cut on the evening of June 30th, where there are those extra scenes of Buford and his staff riding past the seminary. They're interacting with some of the townspeople and some of the elected officials. And there's this sort of uh, kind of foreboding moment where the camera after Buford passes by the building, it pans up toward the cupola on this northeastern section. Too fat to talk too much. They never think twice about asking a man to die for him. That's sort of a foreshadowing of what we'll see in the in the standard version of the film on the morning of July 1st, uh, after Buford's men have encountered Confederate forces west of town in the preceding hours, we now come back to this location and we have the arrival of Major General John Reynolds. And the camera, as I understand it, is placed at about the roof line, which is about 20 feet below the real cupola, about 50 feet off the ground. And you have this sort of dual shot of Buford in the cupola, Sam Elliott, of course, portraying him, uh, looking down and coming right across this path, which is today part of our uh, mile-long walking trail around the seminary grounds, it looked a little different in 1992 when it was being filmed. This was the historic Tan Bark Path in 1863. And we see John Rothman portraying Reynolds and his staff coming uh, over and across to about this location. And we have this initial conversation between these two generals, the famous dialogue, what goes, John? The devil's to pay. Can you hold? I reckon I can. Let's go and see. That all plays out right here. And how does that line up with what really happened here on July 1st, 1863? So it gets into a bit about a variety of different accounts that we have. Uh, the account that we see play out on screen, which of course is influenced by what happens in Michael Shower's The Killer Angels, most of that dialogue matches up almost verbatim with Aaron Jerome, who is the first lieutenant and acting signal officer with John Buford's cavalry division. Um, however, if we look at the historical record for those who are closer to Buford, you for, uh, to Reynolds, excuse me, those on Reynolds' staff, uh, they don't tend to mention the seminary as the initial meeting place until some of their later accounts. But the earlier accounts all seem to point toward McPherson Ridge as being sort of the primary location that these two officers are initially meeting. Uh, I tend to believe in my interpretation and, and kind of the way we interpret it here is that the truth is somewhere in between those, mm -hmm. that there must be an initial meeting here, it seems. There's enough evidence to suggest that and then they go out to McPherson Ridge and kind of make their more formal plans there. Mm -hmm. So what I see the film doing is sort of combining Aaron Jerome's account with the likes of Charles Vale and others who are closer to General mm -hmm. Reynolds, saying that the meeting happened at a slightly different location, mm -hmm. half a mile or so to the west of us. Yeah, and I think it's perfectly acceptable for Michael Shera to have done that. Uh, I think he really did his homework in so many regards, and it's a good creative amalgamation of a lot of different accounts, because after all, that is what historical novelists and later on screenwriters do. So whenever a film company wants to shoot at an actual historic site, there are some inherent problems and challenges that they are going to confront. We can look at The Longest Day in Normandy. We can look at John Adams in Colonial Williamsburg. What were the pros and cons or some of the obstacles that the filmmakers faced in filming at the actual location here at the seminary and perhaps elsewhere in Adams County? Yeah, so with the, the movie Gettysburg being filmed entirely on location throughout Adams County, that includes quite a number of spaces that were actually used 130 years before uh, the film was, was released in 1863, including here at the seminary. And they had a select number of weeks that they were able to utilize these protected grounds or private grounds, uh, as it were in this case. And here at the seminary, one of the things that they have to deal with, as with other places on the, on the field, but especially in such a high concentration of buildings here that were non-existent in 1863. And so one of the things that they
they have to do is create a second seminary. And they build a western facade at, a, I think, about two-thirds scale of the uh, actual structure that's here behind us. And it was only the, the back side, the western side, that we are standing in front of right now, uh, a few miles west of Gettysburg out toward Cashtown. And so for those first day battle sequences, or the moments when we see, even before that, on the evening of the 30th, early morning July 1st, Buford and his staff riding out in the seminaries in the background, uh, that's a set piece that's off in the background. And when we look at this terrain today, we can see that this building sits up on top of the ridge, really no matter where you are in this swale between McPherson and Seminary Ridges. But in the film with that set piece, it sits a little lower. Uh -huh. And that's one of the ways that when you're looking at those scenes, you can kind of tell uh, what's the real cupola in the background, what's the fake cupola in the background, uh, or the real building in the background, and the fake building in the background. Uh, but with that, I kind of gave away the punchline. Uh, we have the, uh, the, the fact that there are also two cupolas, the famous structure at the top of the building is reproduced on top of that uh, mm -hmm. on top of that fake set piece that they used as the building that's in the background. Uh -huh. On a building like this as well, we can look through the years at some of the changes architecturally to it. If we look toward the top center of it, there's a fan-shaped window with two vents that are half circles as well. Uh, during the battle, those would have been square. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, the, the uh, set piece version of, uh, that's used in the film, they went with the more modern uh, half circular design. So some of those Continuity. other ways, we can kind of see that it was a little different. Uh -huh. yeah. Have you had a chance to speak with anybody who filmed here on site in 1992 and what some of their observations might have been. Yeah, absolutely. So most of our interaction has been with folks involved in the cupola scenes and in the meeting scenes between Buford and Reynolds on the front lawn, uh, specifically folks who were part of the Signal Corps of the Susquehanna, a uh, group of living historians that portrays that piece of, of the army, which was of course relatively new during the battle in 1863, the U.S. Signal Corps uh, playing an integral role in communications. And uh, we have spoken with some of the figures who were involved uh, with the Signal Corps in the movie. Uh, one gentleman named Ron Paul gave us a, a great sense of exactly uh, how they filmed on the specific sites in the real cupola versus the fake cupola, the certain shots that they had to get to ensure that they wouldn't see anything modern in the background. And then also uh, I've spoken to Alice Evans, a National Park Service ranger at Eisenhower National Historic Site, and her grandfather Paige Evans, who unfortunately has passed. I didn't get the opportunity to speak directly with him, uh, but she gave me some good anecdotes and some good contacts for uh, other individuals who, like him, were involved in the Signal Corps scene. So we've been able to uh, look at some of the scenes. We can see multiple people who are outside of the major actors here at the seminary. We're able to identify them and actually able to look at some of their ranks, get an understanding of the roles that uh, they would have been serving historically in those moments that are being depicted. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. So can we head up top? Absolutely. All right, let's go see the view. Competing with a lot of wind up here, but we're going to do our best to uh, soldier on. Uh, so, what what scenes were filmed up here in the actual cupola? So, in the actual cupola, I think we only get really one scene, and it's that meeting between Buford and Reynolds. The others are all, it seems, uh, filmed in that set piece, a few miles off to the west. So, for the real moment that we actually see filmed here, it, uh, the camera is down along the roof line looking down across the path that we can see a sliver of. The parking area and the driveway that are here today would not have been there in 1992 when they were filming. And then we see that initial meeting between Buford and Sam Elliott standing basically where you are, uh, on the northeast corner looking down at General Reynolds and they're kind of shouting back and forth with one another. Uh, the remainder of the scenes that take place in the cupola by and large are filmed at that set. And instead of a modern Gettysburg in the background toward the east of us, which is roughly triple the size it was in 1863 and has things like power lines and more vegetation than would have been there at the time, uh, instead, they took a Matthew Brady photograph from mid-July 1863, painted it so that it was colorized, and that is what we see in the background as the 1863 Gettysburg. And so, uh, you had mentioned, you know, the only time we see civilians is that evening before the battle. This is the only time we actually see the town of Gettysburg uh, is in this, uh, recreated in this Matthew Brady photo that's, that's in the background. 
Uh, but other than that, we have uh, also the, the moments that are uh, depicting looking off to the south, a view that was much more open at the time when Reynolds is riding up the Emmitsburg Road with the round tops in the background. Uh, that is actually essentially the view you would have seen from here in reality in 1863. Uh, but starting around the 1950s, a lot of that vegetation started to grow up. So some of those scenes, they had to do some workarounds as far as what we're seeing. But when spliced together, it's relatively seamless to the viewer's eye. And I think the incorporation of the Brady photograph, it's very convincing looking. Yes. Uh, you know, it's, it's not CGI. It's a very practical uh, effect. But... They must have blown, I don't know how they blew the photo up that high resolution in the early 1990s, but it, it's very convincing. It very much looks the part. It really does. And, you know, for reference, for, for those who might be uh, interested, that picture is taken probably about half a mile or so to the north of us in reality. So it's, it is nearby to this location. It would have been very near the, uh, the headquarters of Robert E. Lee at the Mary Thompson House, sort of in that general vicinity. So it, it is a seminary ridge view and features many of the exact same landmarks that you would have seen from here in 1863. So this is the original building, but it's not the original cupola. Tell us uh, how that all came about. Sure, so on August 18th, 1913, which is about six weeks after the 50th anniversary of the battle, just for reference in our timeline, uh, the cupola was struck by lightning and caught fire and it burned down to about the roof line, so pretty much down to about our feet. And it's rebuilt by the following spring of 1914 above that point. Uh, while not original, it, it's pretty much identical in terms of its dimensions. And a tie-in to the film, we often like to say, it, it's half-jokingly, but this is more often than not the case, uh, we tell people that even though you're not standing in the cupola that Buford stood in, you're standing in the cupola that Sam Elliott stood in. And most people are even more excited, I think, by that prospect than they are by the actual John Buford. I mean, yes. <laughs> I mean, both men are national treasures. Yes. So uh, who can blame people for thinking that way? What is uh, one aspect of the movie Gettysburg and pertaining to the actions on July 1st that you think the movie could have done a little bit better on? I think just really focusing on the fact that it is a much larger affair than the film might have you think. Um, we sort of see the, the highlights of uh, Buford wanting to make his defense, the opening moments, but it's doesn't seem like very long after that we see the arrival of General Reynolds and then especially the pace really picks up from there. Now of course it's a it's a long enough film uh, as is you can't add a whole lot there without making it even you know rather excessive but uh, one might view the film and mistakenly think that uh, this all happens over the course of, of a couple of hours whereas it is a sustained action from you know early in the morning until uh, late in the afternoon. Uh, getting a sense of the fact that you have things happening both west as well as north of town, getting a real sense of, of scope and scale rather than making it seem as though it's a mere precursor to what happens on July 2nd and 3rd, I think fully contextualizing the fact that uh, it does involve some 50,000 combined soldiers, uh, nearly a third of whom mm -hmm. are casualties by day's end. Mm -hmm. As we've said it many times on this channel, you just can't fit it all in there. Yep. You have it time and time again. That wraps up this episode of Real History. We sincerely thank our friends at the Seminary Ridge Museum. And Cody, what's, uh, how can people uh, visit or support the Seminary Ridge Museum if they decide to come visit Gettysburg in person? Feel free to visit our website, simply seminaryridgemuseum.org. We are currently open uh, every day except for Tuesday, 9 to 5. You can find a full schedule of events, tickets to get to the cupola at the top of the building where we offer a 30-minute guided tour going over many of the aspects we've covered today as pertain to the fighting on July 1st, 1863. You can also find us on social media, especially at Facebook, Instagram, and we're looking to grow our social media uh, platform as we get into the fall and winter. But feel free to check us out, seminaryridgemuseum.org. Wonderful. And there are a few better places to consider where Civil War history and cinematic history merge together. This is a prime location to be considering all of those things. So, until next time on Real History, stay curious. <laughs>